With the, the generous support of the Open Society Foundations and the Global Drug Policy Programme, we've brought to Budapest 30 international experts who work on the particular impact of drug policy and drug policy enforcement on women and how women are disadvantaged and stigmatised um, and suffer far more punitive and coercive um, interventions by the state in the enforcement of drug policy than typically is the case with men. What were the special like challenges and uh, problems you met as a, as a woman who used drugs? It was a very male-dominated culture when I was taking drugs. And the attitude from male drug users was women's place we should be in the home. So a lot of the male drug users had women in their lives, like wives or girlfriends, who didn't take drugs. And they were kind of sanctified. You know, they were good women and we were the really bad women. In Indonesia, there are gendered roles for women to play. So one example of this we found in our research was the practice of uh, turbo, which comes from tukar body, which means uh, basically to trade one's body. And it's a, a very common practice among female drug users, um, where in cases where they don't have money, they uh, exchange sex or sexual favors for drugs. And often they do this not just for themselves, but, but potentially also to supply their partner's drug use as well. We know that the, the majority of people who use illicit drugs are young males. But are there any like women-specific risks when we talk about drug use? There are women-specific risks in terms of drug use. Women, for example, tend to use syringes of male partners or the syringes of male friends, and that increases the risk factors to women. But what we're particularly interested in is how women are actually dealt with by the system and the kind of the political economy of the drug trade. As in most political economy frameworks, women tend to be at the bottom of the profit and production chain. What do we know, know about the production level, like for example, coca growing? Do we see women among the producers? Often it's a family business and the women are as engaged uh, as men in, in the family business, so to speak. But what you find is that when the government comes in with any kind of programs to try and help people develop other sources of uh, income, usually those programs are directed towards men. And another issue we find is that coca production will often provide independence for women in that they have their own plot of coca and uh, hence they have the, uh, their own income stream which gives them some independence. The government comes in and eradicates that and that has a direct impact on women. In China, Hong Kong, Macau and in Thailand, women are a minority of the prison population but they seem to be incarcerated at a higher rate for drug offences than men. They're not in control of, um, at, at the high level in, in the supply chain. There's no violence involved. Their role is mainly just transportation, moving drugs from one place to another. You conducted a specific research on uh, women who use drugs who are incarcerated in Thailand. Can you talk about the results? What we found is that a lot of women uh, are just first-time offenders. A lot of them have no criminal lifestyle. Uh, a lot of them uh, were tricked by um, uh, their trusted male partner. In countries such as Argentina, Peru, Costa Rica, Brazil, more than 60% of women who are in jail are there for low-level drug offenses. They're women who come from situations of uh, extreme poverty, they have very little education, lack of employment opportunities, and a, an astounding number are single moms. I mean, we've studied countries where 90% of these women are single, heads of households and often for them getting involved in some aspect of the drug trade is an easy way for them to combine their need to put food on the table for their kids with earning an income. Most of these women have faced violence, um, sexual abuse and violence outside of prison. Once they get into prison they are even more vulnerable to, to, to abuse by, by guards.
What about the public health and social care system? Are there any like challenges women have there? Women are typically very reluctant to try and seek help because of the high risk you might lose custody of your children, lose access to your children. Women don't tend to have women-specific services or facilities available to them. Doctors tend to be less sympathetic to women who are using drugs or who have problems of dependence. When you try to enter uh, treatment or recovery services, were there any specific challenges there as a woman? Not for me because I don't have children. Mm -hmm. But you see it still, like women with children can't get into treatment. The only women that I know that have got into treatment are the ones whose grandparents are willing to look after their children when they go into treatment because services won't pay for that. There's certain treatment centres will take on men more than they take on women because they want success rates. So they realise that the services aren't there for women when they leave, so they're less likely to stay clean. We have started to deal with the issue of women whose drugs not having uh, equal access to harm reduction services, especially to methadone programs was much lower than access among men. We learned from women that the main barrier to any kind of services was that they were not protected from violence. And it was two types of violence. It was domestic violence, um, violence on behalf of their intimate partners who didn't want these women to come and get services, but also there was police violence and violence uh, occurring from the health system. What about uh, gender sensitive harm reduction services in the region? Are there any uh, good examples for that? You know, there are a lot of examples. You can provide pregnancy tests, you can provide vouchers to go to a gyneco gynecologist, for instance. You may have like child services, a lot of different things. But where you start, you actually hire women drug users as outreach workers. Drug use during pregnancy is a very sensitive issue in the, in the media and in the public discourse. What do you think, how should we address this issue? We have some quite astonishing laws in relation to um, drug using pregnant women. Um, there are states in, in America, for example, where you can actually face uh, the conviction for what's called intrauterine trafficking, um, which means essentially that you are trafficking drugs to your unborn fetus. Women who are pregnant risk losing their children, having their children taken off them by the state, rather than there being the kind of interventions and help and support that so many pregnant women need. Overwhelmingly, where you have circumstances where you have a pregnant drug using woman, then the priority and the emphasis has to be on the support to the pregnant woman um, and ensuring that she gets the treatment services um, which are necessary for her support through that pregnancy. Many people think that children have to be taken away from, from women who, who are dependent on drugs. What do you think about that? It's a case by case issue. Um, what we do know about drug using uh, parents and drug using women is that it's very much about having structured lifestyle, it's having the kind of multi-agency interventions and support to enable families to stay together and to ensure that women and their children are protected within the overall care system. Unlike the United States where more often than not if you're imprisoned and, and are pregnant your child is taken away as soon as you are born. In Latin America it's more common for women to be able to have their children with them in prison. But then of course you have a whole situation of women with infants in prisons which are more or less than not filthy, your basic needs aren't being met. Studies have shown that when a man is incarcerated, other women in his life, either his mother, his sister, or his partner will take responsibility for the children while he is incarcerated. That is not the case for, for single women in particular. Often they are abandoned by their families because of the stigma of have, having been engaged in the drug trade. So it's a tremendous dram drama in terms of what they do with their children. And we see cases where some are put in into end up in abusive relationships with distant relatives or in government facilities that are really poorly equipped and, and in very bad facilities. Often they end up on the street and that you where you get these cycles of poverty and drug use and, and incarceration. <laughs> Some
Sometimes feminist groups and movement for women's rights have somewhat controversial uh, relationship to issues like sex work or drug use. Some of the the more kind of problematic expected allies would be feminist organisations and women's groups and yet there is an awful lot of hostility to dealing with these issues and that's because there seems to be this idea that you have good women and bad women um, and the issues associated with bad women are simply not taken on board largely by the women's movement. Feminist groups will say you know we don't work on drug policy it's not our issue but if you look at the way in which drug policies you know discriminate, discriminate against women um, the negative consequences for women, I think that you have to address it in a holistic, holistic manner. Women's groups and feminist organizations will only want to look at it if the women are happy to describe themselves as victims. So if you can say, this bad man made me do this, or I really didn't want to be doing this, and I got caught up in it because I was young or I was vulnerable, and especially around sex work. It always has to be framed as problematic, as does drug use, always. We need to be really careful about our messaging. When we've spoken with some policymakers um, in Southeast Asia, the response is often is immediately going towards sympathising women and seeing them as victims um, and assuming that they were exploited, that they were tricked, much like um, Mary Jane Veloso, the lady who was on death row in Indonesia. Officials in Malaysia or Indonesia, for example, they will say, you know, they shouldn't be punished. They're doing this for love. Like this is literally what um, what someone in Malaysia in Malaysian said. Um, they're tricked by boyfriends, um, husbands, and so on to carry to carry drugs, and so they shouldn't be punished as drug traffickers because they were just doing it to please their their male partner. Also, in some other countries, there's quite a bit of blaming on Nigerian men in particular, um, and assuming that it is that the drugs that are in the country. Um, are because there are Nigerian men bringing them into the country. How do you see the drug reform movement itself? Are women equally represented in, in like uh, advocacy groups or drug user groups? We have excellent women and men who are involved in the drug policy reform movement. What we're trying to do is empower those women who are directly affected by the impacts of drug policy enforcement. So anyone's child's a network of families from all over the globe whose lives have been destroyed by the drug war through a number of different ways. Many have suffered bereavements, but some have had children imprisoned. Some have experienced terrible health impacts. We're trying to tell the human stories and, and stories of women and men, in fact. But it was, it was very much started up um, by, by one woman's story, uh, um, Anne-Marie Coburn, who very tragically lost her 15-year-old daughter to an accidental ecstasy overdose. And she's very much uh, pioneered the campaign and become a very vocal spokesperson, partly because it's very unexpected that a mother would come out um, having experienced such tragic loss and believe that legal regulation would be the solution. I think there are many active women who are finding their voices and starting to challenge the drug war and it's a very powerful voice. Mm -hmm.